in monitoring and analyzing security threats, assisting in penetration tests and social engineering, as well as supporting forensic examinations inside the forensic lab. Brent earned his associate degree in cybersecurity networking, as well as his CNSS certificates at Rose State, and he also has his TIA Security Plus certification. And a face that may look familiar to many of you here uh, at OCCC, John McHenry teaches courses in our cybersecurity program here at OCCC. He's worked in the field of uh, IT and information security since 2010. He's got a bachelor's degree in information security, a master's in business administration. He's also obtained some of these, uh, these cool hieroglyphics uh, <laughs> that, that the rest of these guys have in uh, industry certifications. A plus, Network Plus, Security Plus, CompTIA, along with LFS 101 from the Linux Foundation, and also Associate of ISC2. He's taught information technology, information security courses on a collegiate level since 2012, and also worked as well as an IT consultant and a systems network engineer. He's currently pursuing his PhD in higher ed. Please welcome our panel. I read you a little bit about what they do, and I'll let them tell you a little bit about what they do to, uh, to start off and kind of give you an idea and a feel for the, the, the type of experts that we've got up here. You can come start by taking some things that you might like to learn from them. Anyway, Scott, if you clean us off, just tell us a little bit. I guess I'm a little bit tired. I had a good lunch. But uh, what I do basically, in a nutshell, sit there and twiddle my thumbs waiting for attacks to occur. No, not really. Attacks occur all the time. Um, and I work at Northrop Grumman and I specialize in cybersecurity for them. I am one of two cybersecurity engineers for the program that I work on, which I can't name, unfortunately, because of its classification. The, I'll just say that it's um, very prevalent to your lives. I'll leave it at that. Um, Northrop Grumman is a defense contractor. For those of you that do not know, uh, we support the Department of Defense in a lot of different areas, whether it be space, whether it be military airlift, things of that nature, okay? Satellite communications, aircraft, you name it, missiles, all that. I deal with everything from policies and procedures all the way to anti tamper Okay, anti-tamper is basically where we put devices in that will do things like Mission Impossible. Okay, it will cause a component to fail if something or some actor tries to take an attempt to do something they shouldn't do. Okay, for example, you plug in a USB drive and you try to log into it and you have three failed attempts, it blows up that USB drive. Not literally into smoke, but it melts it to where you can't use it any longer. Okay, that type, that's anti-tamper. So there's a wide range of activities that I oversee. Um, the program that I deal with is $96 billion a year, or over the course of this project, I should say. So that kind of gives you a rough order of magnitude of the scope of cybersecurity uh, things that we can deal with. Um, we deal with IT systems. Um, we deal with not just networks, we deal with HVAC systems, we deal with physical security, operational security, industrial security. Cybersecurity is not just limited to one aspect. Okay, so that, that's kind of what I oversee. So I have a wide swath of knowledge and experience in that field. Bailey? So I have to be careful with both what I say and trying to also be succinct. So I have been best described by one of my friends as basically a mathematician that understands computer hardware. When I was stationed in Atlanta prior to my move to Oklahoma City, I would specialize mostly in botnets and malware analysis. So say that there was maybe a malware that was used in basically a cyber declaration of war, I would recreate that system in order for us to find vulnerabilities. So I would take that malware, reverse engineer it, put a system together that would be able to function utilizing it, and then I would launch attacks from it on FBI networks, which is really shady. <laughs> uh, 
I also, I have been used to break into systems. I specialize the G pin from my hieroglyphic stands for penetration testing, which is basically red teaming or attacking. So I am utilized to break into systems that are locked. I utilize that botnet past I had to focus on distributed computing. So if there was something that was encrypted, we needed to work on it, I would do my best to take what systems we had, use math to determine what my maximum number of systems were until the overhead cost of communications would actually be too much because there's actually a point where you plateau and start dive bombing if you add too many computers. So it would make little miniature supercomputer networks. I also am deployed on search warrants. A lot of the computer scientists are actually very active field employees. So a lot of people think we're just like sitting behind a desk, running numbers, reverse engineering malware, writing scripts, or being programmers. I am actually a field operative, technically, by my job title. Full title is computer scientist field operative. And when we have a child pornography case, for instance, we are deployed alongside our CART, our digital forensics team. And, you know, break of dawn, we're up there with agents that have their guns, and we're waiting for them to clear the house. We go in, we collect evidence. I've been fortunate to be on cases where someone's actively running tour, and I have to perform a live analysis of what's going on on the scene, and like, hey, this is all the CP he's been pulling, and this is how his network is mapped. So I, I also map networks that I run into. Uh, I don't want to drag on too long about what I do, because like I said, I pretty much cover it. Our position in the FBI was built to blend the gap of, well, we have ITS people, but do we have people that are basically offense and defense for us as well? So we just kind of like, okay, does it involve a computer? And is it something that's desktop support? Bailey does it. <laughs> uh, if I think of anything else later to mention, I will definitely go into more detail about it. Uh, right now, I did some of my graduate work research on ICS and SCADA systems. And that's one of, I'm getting my eighth hieroglyphic in a certification in ICS systems. <laughs> but I just gave a presentation last week on it and I was like, I'm not certified in this yet, but um, <laughs> yeah, take my word for it. So like I said, if I, met, if I think of anything else, uh, mostly what I'm working on right now in this office is uh, cryptography, working on those distributed computing systems and reverse engineering of malware, trying to also, you know, classify sensor myself, <laughs> as well as classify censoring. All right, we're going to say that's all I do. Cool. <laughs> so it's Brent's turn. <laughs> so my role at Alias Forensics uh, is uh, kind of play multiple parts in the way our organization is structured. We all do a little bit of everything. So I guess I'll talk a little bit about digital forensics. Uh, kind of my role in that realm is uh, we, for our clients, we assist in either data recovery or digital forensics, meaning uh, investigations uh, for litigation and stuff like that. So uh, we may have uh, somebody who brings a cell phone in, uh, for example, uh, maybe there was, an, there was an accident that happened and so we're charged with going in and taking, collecting this phone and doing an investigation to determine maybe if an individual was you know, texting somebody during this period of time or uh, calling someone or using an app. Uh, so we do collections on many different types of devices, obviously cell phones, uh, laptops, desktop computers, uh, really run the gamut of any type of collection as far as any type of digital evidence. Uh, my other roles, uh, so I help with social engineering, so we help our clients uh, kind of basically do training for their users, so we may be tasked with performing phishing, enga phishing engagements for a company. So sending out uh, fake emails with links or attachments that uh, uh, the users may click on and that basically notifies them that, hey, this was a uh, phishing email, you know, just kind of as training for the users to help be aware of attacks like that. Uh, penetration testing as well as another service we do, so I assist. Uh, we do obviously external and internal penetration tests, so that's everything from scanning, uh, scanning the networks, uh, assisting the client, and maybe they have some sort of specific thing we're wanting to look at, whether it be maybe SCADA or some specific program or tool that they use we want us to focus on specifically. We kind of uh, work with the client in helping identify vulnerabilities in that and then uh, kind of going in and remediating those. And uh, 
also, so we have a secure operations center as well. So we have our clients that may have a, either a IDS IPS system or a, a SIM tool. And so we assist them uh, as obviously many organizations have a lot to keep up with in the security field. And so we assist them by uh, monitoring those tools, uh, managing alerts and responding to different incidents that may occur. All right, my primary role here um, at OCCC um, is working in their cybersecurity program, um, basically educating uh, our students to work in the cybersecurity field. Um, my passion is being able to break down cybersecurity into like kind of like the lowest common denominator where they're able to understand it on a rudimentary level and then build from there. Um, I find a lot out there that a lot of your issues with um, understanding cybersecurity is in the language used. Um, so being able to, you know, break it down to something everyday language and then build off of that into terms that are used every day in the field is something uh, I use uh, with a lot of advantage. Um, my prior roles, um, I have served as a security and network engineer, um, I'm sorry, systems and network engineer at Oklahoma County uh, in their data center. Um, I've also done a short stint of um, help desk at Dell, um, as well as I also served as the chair of information technology um, at ITT before it went defunct. Um, so I've kind of been around both in um, IT, IIS, and also in education. Um, my current focus is on um, helping students not just learn IT, but to have opportunities to change their lives for the better. So. No, it's not. It's not really gone. <laughs> because you can go in there and fight it. Yeah. That's exactly right. Okay. Um, well, as far as uh, our group here as a, as a college, okay, something that we probably uh, all have in common is we're all on our common email server. And our IT department does a, a fantastic job at keeping us you know, safe from, from phishing. But every once in a while, one, one will get through. And the, I think we as a group are getting smart about recognizing them and not clicking on them. But of course, the, the, the hackers and the pitchers are getting, getting smarter as well in the way that they make those things look. So that's a question to the group who are, who are wants to answer. Um, if you have some sort of malicious phishing email. And we think it's from something that's legit and it's not and, and click on it. What are some of the scary things that can happen? And how do we prevent uh, ourselves from, from, from falling prey to that? So some of the scary things that can happen from it if you click on the link and it's basically somewhere asking you to have your information entered into it, they have that information you provided. So they either have your credit card information, they have your student user login, and that would allow them to actually propagate the attack. So normally when they do an initial phishing attack, they're trying to get that first victim to give them access to something legitimate, which then afterward it's no longer a phishing attack that was manufactured with fake email addresses and something that's not attributed to the, uh, the company or the college, for instance, but it's coming from a legitimate person in that college. So we've had incidents before where colleges, I went to response to an incident, they uh, had like a higher up person in their management at the college and they were sending emails out to students. So there was no way for the student to tell this is not an illegitimate email. This is coming from someone who is here. This is their email and this is a message from them. So that was actually one of the, it's actually probably the worst case scenario because you actually increase the amount of victims you have that way the quickest. I feel like I'm also just teaching y'all how to be really good at fishing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, though, so that's one major consequence is you yourself become a source for more victims. Yeah, but I would just like to add on to that as, as another example, we've actually, Recently, we've worked a couple cases kind of along that realm uh, relating to wire transfer fraud. So we've had uh, a couple cases come through where 
an individual has maybe clicked on a link and entered their credentials. Those credentials were then stolen and the attackers were actually sending out uh, wire transfer uh, requests to individuals in this person's address book. And so uh, that's kind of another example that can happen where those credentials get stolen and uh, it just propagates from there. So. I think the main way to prevent it, and there's really no way to fully prevent it. I mean, there's, there's no way to mitigate that risk down to zero. Um, but it comes through education, um, being able to educate your employees, but educate yourself, um, especially with the way IT is evolving like, continuously. Um, you can't stay stagnant with what you know. You need to make sure, um, be willing to question. You know, don't just assume something is legit because it looks legit. You know, be willing to ask questions. Like if you, if an email comes from somebody that seems legit, you know, give that person a phone call. Say, hey, I got this email from you. You know, is this in fact legit? You know, that's the quickest way to find out if something is, you know, a phishing attempt or not. Um, so a lot of it, it's really, it really is used to use common sense and not just trusting blindly. So. Scott, um, you're uh, overseeing a, a big system uh, at Fort Brown, and of course, it's a, a good size system here. And what type of things do uh, do you guys put into place at you know at, at your level, like college IT level, to help protect? The, the staff and, and whatnot out of North Carolina, which I assume probably involves some national defense type of, uh, of, of you know, subjects that are, that are pretty sensitive. No, actually, uh, they're going to be pretty straightforward, just as any system would be in any commercial environment. You're still going to have the same type of controls that you're going to put in place in your home, at work, or in the Department of Defense. Now, Think about it as you go to Best Buy. You have how many different types of routers? You have the Soho routers, small office, home office routers, right? We all probably have one in our home. You can call Cisco, Juniper, Nortel, well, Nortel's gone now, but um, some of the other companies and say, hey, I want to buy a bigger router for a small, medium, or large enterprise business, right? Each one of these are gonna have the same vulnerabilities. They have an operating system. Okay, do you maintain it with updates on firmware and patches? Those same controls apply no matter where you're at. So it just depends on the not really the scope of the installation, but the controls that you're gonna put into place. How much time and energy do you want to put in to your information system? It's called risk management. That's really what it comes down to be. Okay, you'll hear that term quite a bit in cybersecurity. It comes down to risk. And risk is always going to be coming into play from your upper management. Cost and schedule versus your resources. I guarantee you, as a cybersecurity professional, you are never going to get the funding you need to implement a secure environment. So you're going to have to jerry-rig things to put it together. Okay. So implementing controls to the best of your ability to minimize risk is how we do it. Now, whether that means I put in antivirus protection on every machine that there is, I limit it what, what we call a footprint. Y'all are familiar with the term footprint, right? Limit the scope and breadth of what my system and functionality is going to be. In my instance, I don't have any web-based system in my information system that I use. So there is no web-based controls. I can throw out 90% of the problems for web applications cross-site script, all that type of stuff I can throw out. I come down to probably a total of about 20 secure coding controls or common weakness enumerations, okay? That's really the scope of what I have to look at. I have to look at, do I implement this type of protocol? Is it a secure protocol? Is it an unsecure protocol? For example, Telnet. Am I gonna use Telnet in an environment? No, it's an unsecure protocol. Everything's sent in clear text. I want to use SSH, secure shell, or SCP, secure copy. Okay, those are the types of things that you have to think about as a cybersecurity professional, and that's what we do. John, I know you probably work a little bit with Rock here a little bit. To, to, to some extent, maybe you might be able to speak to what precautions and whatnot those guys take for. 
Well, um, <clears throat> excuse me. With Rob Greggs, I mean, a lot of what he does is on the uh, OCCC side of things, um, as far as back end, making sure, you know, filters in place and things of that nature. But on, for, as far as the students, a lot of it comes to just awareness. Um, you know, sending out emails about different things that have occurred. Um, I've seen several times over the last couple months where they went ahead and say, hey, we saw this phishing email come through. If you see this, don't respond to it. If you see anything else, please report it to us. Just making students aware of uh, what's out there and what to look for so they don't fall prey to phishing or whatever it happens to be. Um, so a lot of it, when it comes to our side, at least looking at it from a student and on the community side, is awareness more than anything else. Um, so, uh, but obviously on the back side, you know, on, with the systems, a lot more goes into that that's, you know, transparent to the user, so. If I don't mind piggybacking back on what John just said, how many of y'all are familiar with the term insider threat? means someone on internal to your organization. How many realize if you don't have the information awareness that John is just talking about, you are an insider threat to your company or your organization? You're the one that caused the issue by not paying attention, not having the adequate training. Now, if the company did not provide that for you, then it's the company's fault or the installation. But they do. They're required to. So then they provide that to you. But if you don't pay attention to what you do, You've created yourself an insider threat to that company. So be cognizant of that. And that's something we, all of us, have to take into consideration. That is the number one issue and problem that we all face, is the insider threat. And I'll, I'll pick you back off of that and say, you know, in IT, um, you know, the user is your primary issue. I mean, you can go ahead and spend millions of dollars on all kind of configurations, all kind of hardware and software, but at the end of the day, it comes down to a user problem. Um, so being able to make sure that you've mitigated that user risk as much as possible is gonna go a long way in ensuring that your system stays secure. So. Well, that's an easy one. Yeah, really. Close <laughs> <laughs> your ears. Uh, you're saying I didn't perpetrate any of this. Okay. No, no. <laughs> now, watch out for the suspicious characters that have the backpacks on the table. How many of y'all are familiar with the Wi-Fi pineapple? What that does is that allows you to have a device that simulates the Wi-Fi of the company or where the location you're at. So if I'm at Starbucks and I have a Wi-Fi pineapple, I send my computer through this Wi-Fi pineapple to connect to that Wi-Fi. I then create a stronger signal on my Wi-Fi pineapple so that all of you connect to my Wi-Fi pineapple. So basically, I've created a vampire tap, and you're going right through my connection in my computer so I see your traffic. I record your traffic because it's unencrypted until it gets out. Unless you sit a VPN tunnel from your computer out to wherever you're going, it's clear text until it gets to that Wi-Fi. So you've just given me everything I need. Passwords, usernames for your social media accounts. Oh, that's so much fun. You didn't hear me say that, Bailey. <laughs> but those are the kinds of things that you don't want to do. So watch out for suspicious characters. Now, we're all suspicious, right? In, in all honesty, the Wi-Fi and the pineapple, how many of y'all have those remote batteries, you know, like the USB plug-in batteries that you can have? That's about the size of a Wi-Fi pineapple. And it's not a pineapple like you would see at the grocery store, so don't think that. It <laughs> literally looks like one of those, just sitting there. And it just sits there, they connect it to the computer. So just be cautious when you see devices hanging off of a computer, make sure that you're really connecting to the true signal. If you see two of the same Wi-Fi, uh, SSIDs, don't connect to either one of them. Bring your own. Connect to your own hotspot on your phone. If, That's what I was going to ask. If I, connect, if I use my phone as a hotspot, does my 
phone have to be directly connected to my computer? No, no, it, it's a Wi-Fi connection, just like if you were connected over here, you can turn it on. You're the only one that know the password, obviously, because you're typing it in on your phone to set up that connection. But unless you share that pre-share key with everyone else, now it is hackable, mm -hmm. so uh, be, be cognizant of that. But unless you share that pre-share key, the majority of the people around you aren't gonna spend the time to try to hack it or, or do that, because you can shut it off pretty quick. Because unless you're connected to that Wi-Fi source, you're using basically your cellular data at, at that point, not the uh, internet connectivity of the whatever business you may be at. So. They're, they're just as, like I said, from your device that you're trying to use the Wi-Fi through, you're still in clear text, so it doesn't matter until you get to that other connection, you're just as vulnerable. So, Whoa. <laughs> so the only way you have one is so you use a VPN, right? VPN creates a yeah, tunnel between your device and wherever you're going. Okay. That's the only way you're going to protect. Protect, it still can be tapped, so just be mm -hmm. cognizant of that, but it's mm -hmm. unlikely that someone's going to get to that. I saw two questions. So I just have a question, like, um, when you say that the vampire one will basically be a copy of the first one, so let's say I went to a Starbucks and I use their free Wi-Fi on Monday, and then that person comes on a Tuesday, and I come back on a Tuesday, but I have my phone remembered the Wi-Fi, is it going to automatically pull straight into that? It'll, it'll pull into their SSID. And your SSID does not have a password because it's a free Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. So it's going to pull into the strongest signal strength. Which would be theirs. Which would be theirs. So you're going to connect to theirs, not their store. Their, their Wi-Fi pineapple is connecting to their store through their computer, so therefore everything's passing through that. It's already recognized if I saved it through my phone. Like it is that exact. It is that, that, they're just stealing that Wi-Fi SSID is all they're doing and putting a stronger signal strength so you connect to it. Okay. What I would do to mitigate that is to, I know we're all about convenience in today's day and age, but don't have it automatically save that. Don't have it automatically connect. You know, it's a, it's a one extra step to go ahead and put the password in or whatever you have to do to connect, but you don't want to have it automatically connect without your permission or without even paying attention. So. Well, and then the consequence of things also automatically connecting is <clears throat> if you have it and it's password protected as well, there's something known as a deauth attack. So if you're at home and you have a weak Wi-Fi password for your own home router, say it's like password one, something simple, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, someone can actually knock you off of your Wi-Fi and then they can watch you send that information back over to connect and then they can take that packet that was sent over the wireless network and then they can actually attack it with their, because laptops come with GPUs now, they can actually do password crack attacks, they can do rainbow table attacks, they can try to just take your Wi-Fi network access as well, which is the last thing you want if, say, that person starts looking at CP on your network. You want to make sure that your home network is actually heavily protected with things that aren't the standard password list, things that are alphanumeric symbols, more than eight characters, it's a lot of things that you need to really be aware of, especially since that new RTX 2080 and that 2080 Ti, those are gonna be on laptops. Mm -hmm. Like it's gonna just get even easier for people to be portable while they're doing these attacks. Oh, you got it? It, it really varies as to what the, I guess, your, the initial phishing email could be. It could be any type of sort of email that you get asking you to maybe enter in a password. So it, it really varies as to what that initial phishing email would be. But it's always just good sense to be cognizant of, was I expecting this email from this person or you know, wherever this email came from? Looking at the domain of that email uh, to determine, you know, is this somebody I've reached out to in the past, you know, if it's google.com, but it's actually g0ogle.com, you know, that's some indicators like that can help you identify, well, this, this may not be actually an email I want to click on or something like that. So, so, and also, you know, looking at the link in the email, you can hover over the link 
and see where that link takes you. And if, if it doesn't take you to what this email is associated with, that's another indicator that this could be a phishing email. And also, if you have any power over your ability to have this two-factor authentication, so if anyone did take that information from you by chance and it's too late, because the famous saying is, there's two people in this world, those that know they've been hack and hacked and those that don't. So basically, just always assume someone already has your information and can utilize it, but make sure to have multiple layers of authentication. So if someone was trying to make a change to your account somewhere, you need to have something that's going to say, hey, someone tried to make this change. Was this you? And it, you need to have a notification system like that. And another thing I would say is watch out if you do fall victim to a phishing scam. How many of you use, and don't show your hands, this is rhetorical. <laughs> How many of you use your same password in multiple areas? Think about that. They get you on one. They have your username. They have your name. They can go search your Facebook, your LinkedIn. What are they going to use? They're going to use multiple variations. Your first dot, your last name. Your first initial, middle initial, last name. First initial, last name. All the normal types of email address prefixes and email addresses to log in into every type of known system of major banks, social media networks, and see if they can log in. If they log in, guess what, folks? They get more and more information. So just be wary of that. Keep different passwords for your different networks. Yes? Yeah, I was kind of wondering, okay, I gotta look through and do all this stuff. Here, I change my password and all this. Now, thanks to the security breaches, all my information's out there. What do I do now to mitigate? You know, what do I need to do to help protect me from all the breaches? Reset everything. Reset everything. Yeah. Every email address, every password. Every security question. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> That's the. And I hate to say this, but you're never secure. Yeah. One of my favorite phrases is that security is actually, the definition to security is actually just a feeling. So just because a test dummy survived the car crash, it doesn't mean you are. Like, do you feel safe though? That's security. And another really big piece of advice to any of y'all is to do your taxes as soon as possible. Because like I said, assume your information is out there. They're not gonna do a rehash of your social security number. People are going to be attempting to use that. If you use Venmo and you're like, oh, ha ha, I just did this cute thing and I have like this purchase verified, you're giving people more information of what your most recent purchases are. So if they're calling your credit card company, like, oh yeah, I need access to this. I don't know the number or the pin, but I know the last three purchases. So things are getting more and more social media focused, such as Venmo with the transactions that would be reflective of information people would need to hack you. Question. Well, pretty much I wouldn't use any public Wi Fi. I don't. <laughs> what about Again, that's a public Wi Fi. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I, I'm sorry, sorry but it's a, it's a public <laughs> Wi Fi. I, I don't use it. I use my, I'd rather use my own cellular network on a hotspot where I can start it and stop it when I, in, unless I'm on a physical land connection, I don't use networks. So I'm guessing uh, Wi-Fi also has, does that connect your Wi-Fi but prompts you a password. Is that the same concept as uh, like a public free you know, password Wi-Fi? No, that would be a two-factor uh, two authentication because you're having some sort of authentication to get into it with some sort of credential like a username and password which would be a one time or one use because you're using the same knowledge, right? One time. Now, I would prefer to have a two-factor authentication where you have some sort of device like a device chip, an RFID chip or something to be able to connect into that um, where they have their stored MAC address or something of that nature. Oh, sure. The technology you can do pretty much anything you want. Yeah. Yep. I mean, <clears throat> but go ahead and go back to what Scott was talking about earlier. I mean, security is risk management. You're never going to go ahead and get your risk down to zero. What you, your goal is to get as close as possible. Um, and whether, I mean, you know, whatever you feel comfortable with, whatever, whatever risk you feel comfortable accepting, 
Um, that's really what it comes down to because, you know, as we talked about in our classes, you always are going to have residual risk. Um, but it's how much you can do, you know, and you could spend millions of dollars trying to mitigate risk, but what are you getting out of it? You know, there's a lot of factors go into that. So it's, it's how much you're willing to pony up in resources and time and things of that nature um, versus how much of a real threat uh, you're facing. Does that make sense? And even if you spend all of your money, every inch of you trying to protect yourself from this, you say you go to the hospital, for instance, it's not going to stop their beepers from passing your social security number in clear text. People can actually just sit outside the hospital in downtown capturing wireless information, and they can actually see it if they're on the correct band antenna. Yep. And people just do this as hobbies when they study signals intelligence. <laughs> and that being, okay, some, someone is doing this. Some hacker is, is out there grabbing this, this information, uh, be, it, be it small, be it large. Honestly, what percentage uh, of those people ever actually get caught? And if they do get caught, what are the penalties? What happens? So I actually will not be able to give you a percentage. Anyone I made up would be fake, <laughs> but like most percentages, actually. <laughs> uh, however, so we're asking about penalties for if they get caught. They're actually, for cybercrime at the moment, they haven't caught up with the actual realm of crime because technology is advancing too quickly and policy hasn't been made to punish these people. because. You know, when they made the Constitution, they weren't focused on the advent of the cell phone. Uh, I can, however, as my more area of expertise, uh, speak to what happens in the dark web market. So a lot of people continuously hack and grab lots of information, and they used to make thousands off of this. However, they kind of, you know, criminals aren't economists. They ended up tanking the value of what a person's identity was. So, so many companies eventually got hacked that they would keep releasing it onto the dark web and they're like, I'll sell this to you. I'll give it to you for say, you know, 2000. Like, we don't want that. They're like, okay, well, I'll give it to you for 500. We still don't want that. They, they've actually diluted their economy of malobtained goods so much that it's worth very little. We do deal with that. Uh, is it like a more intense or are there more sophisticated um, individuals that have more tech things that are supposed to make it more difficult to you know, shut them out or you know, stop or even just kind of manage that? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sorry, I had like kind of that horrified thought that comes when you work with classified information and then someone asks a question. So can you repeat it a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. Is it, is it just more difficult to handle those kind of situations? Like, especially if it, you know, is, is another country. You know, you hear about the militaries and stuff, you know, hiring people to live have structure on systems and things like that. Is that, if you were to see that, what it, what it, I don't know how to like, that's just what I'm From about. experience, I actually haven't found it to be that difficult at all, really, because people do continuously leave trails and people have things set up. The U.S. intelligent co community is very close-knit. They work very well together. All the different agencies communicate with each other. We have contacts overseas with different countries. Their intelligence communities communicate with us. So it's actually not as bad as you would think. So say, for instance, how quickly the Ukrainian attack got attributed, like how quickly people were talking about the Sony hack. It didn't seem like any of it was really that difficult. Um, I think the thing we actually have the most difficulty with is, say, I want to, it's not insider threats exactly, but someone who has hacked a person 
and then that person became what seemed to be an insider threat, but that person's like, I don't know what happened. It was an accident. <laughs> so it was like someone playing to be someone else. Then you have to trace back like, oh darn, now I have to work back to see how that person got hacked. And it becomes this rabbit hole and that seems to be much more difficult because usually when a national security case happens and something major as far as an attack happens, like they want you to know they got you. They're like, hey, in your face, you know, we got you. And it seems to be pretty consistent that it, if a country is trying to make a statement and they're using their people to make that statement, they want it to be known. So that's actually a very interesting question because you can't clear your own tracks because even in the case of wiper malwares, I believe the attack in Ukraine was a wiper malware and you know, even then we could still attribute it because just who they attacked, period, was obvious of who did it. Uh, however, there's the issue of people not having their own logs backed up. So if a company in Oklahoma was attacked and they're like, okay, cool, go get them, the average time to be notified of an attack, last I saw, was 234 days. So, yeah, you're not gonna realize you were attacked, but the average default for a log rotation is two weeks. So if you're not notified, which most people hear about it from DHS, from FBI via other intelligence community, uh, from, say, a social, someone like Alias Forensics, they're doing research and they're like, oh, hey, we noticed that you got hacked, but it was 234 days ago. You're going to go there and you're going to be like, well, what evidence is left? The RAM's gone. Someone's probably restarted that computer since then. What if the computer was re-baselined even? And with things such as hard drives, they can't actually have the data overwritten over time. But yeah, that log rotation, that's the biggest nightmare because you go looking for evidence and there's nothing there. Sort of in that thing from a, a hardware standpoint, this might be a question for, for Brent. Um, okay, you, you've had your phone stolen. How safe is your information? Uh, it's all in your phone, but now if somebody else has it, we hear that in the news all the time, well, it's taken the, you know, it's taken the fix forever to crack into that guy's you know, iPhone, and then others a year oh, it's really easy. Can you speak to that? Well, it, it obviously varies by, you know, hardware vendor, and obviously, yeah the length of your passcode, or even if you have a passcode at all on your phone, obviously, <laughs> attributes to that as well. Um, you know, in that example of somebody getting access to, or getting your device, obviously, uh, steps to take would be obviously doing a remote wipe of that device as, as quickly as possible. That way there is, there is not that time, potentially, for uh, an attacker to try to crack that code. Uh, now, with, uh, with Androids, you know, uh, Androids and iPhones, it varies with the success of a password cracking attack. Uh, uh, iPhones have been getting, uh, they're obviously very, they take their security very seriously, and uh, Apple does. And so it really varies with them as to uh, their, their security practices are pretty good. And so it, it would take the expertise of an attacker, you know, the knowledge of the programming and how it works to really kind of decipher that and begin an attack on a device like that. I can be totally upfront and honest with you. Um, just in my research in the last, I want to say about three to four months, uh, I teach at Park University as an adjunct right now. I've taught over the last 12 years at multiple different universities and schools here. Matter of fact, two of the people here 
on the other side of Bailey were my students. Um, I can tell you without a doubt, there's 2.4 million individual shortage in cybersecurity and information systems developers projected in the next five years in the United States alone. So if you're in cybersecurity or a CS field, you are in the right field. Computers are never going to go away. Security is never going to go away. It's only going to get worse. So this is the field to be in. John, that might be an opportunity. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, 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 no definitely. Um, uh, it, it's, it also comes down, you know, of how much you're willing to educate yourself. Um, you know, we offer an associate's here in cybersecurity. Um, Brent, you have your associate's in cybersecurity. I mean, and Brent is fortunate to be where he's at. Um, it's a, very difficult to get in cyber with an associate's. Um, they're working on that kind of trying to, trying to get more cert-centric than degree-centric. But as of right now, most places want you to have a bachelor's to get into cyber. So, you know, keep in mind that if you're wanting to get into fields where um, you have a good chance of landing a job, you're also going to have to be prepared to put in the hours for education, whether that be in a, a university or that be on a industry cert level. So. Why is there that It is the technology and the fact that there's not enough people that have the interest in it to begin with. Security is now a hot topic with all these companies getting hacked. The Sony hack, the Target hack, these are being becoming a very big prevalent issue with a lot of companies. And because of that, everyone's saying, hey, we need these people. At, at first, CEOs didn't care about security. They're like, oh, we don't care about <coughs> new computers. We don't care about our data. But once they get hit with a lawsuit, for your data being stolen, then they care. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, why didn't you put it into a place? Well, you didn't give me the money to put it in place. And then it becomes that, and then they get that money automatically. It's pretty cool. You know, uh, that's where that sh shortage has started from, is because of those lawsuits. And all these other companies are now taking notice, hey, we'd rather be on that forefront. Well, I can't give you tens of millions of dollars. I may be able to give you a million dollars to go do this. But then it comes back to that risk management. How much of that million dollars are you going to be able to put forth into fixing something? Probably span college. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> from, the, from the standpoint of, of you know, uh, career-related questions, if anybody is interested in a career in cybersecurity, like we've been talking about, uh, are there any particular odd-lot uh, skills or proclivities or anything like that that, that might be a good indicator of someone who would do well in that? Problem solving. If you can't, if you can't problem solve, you're not going to be a good fit in this industry. You've got to be able to look at a problem, tear it down, look at the individual components, look at the big picture, and be able to go through the problem solving methodology. Because 90% of it's problem solving. You can teach technical skills all day long, but if you can't problem solve, you're not going to be a good fit in any kind of STEM field, really. I think. I think also, John, that uh, problem solving is, is a big key, but logic mm -hmm. common sense that's where a lot of people miss how many of us say we don't have any common sense pretty much all of us right at some points in our day logic is a real big thing if you don't have the basic understanding of putting point a to point b equal or a plus b equals c mm -hmm. then you're just not going to get the field to be honest with you and just a basic introductory person in the field has to have some sort of degree whether it be an associate's or bachelor's degree. If you're in cyber, you need to have a Security Plus or a GSEC. And perfect example is Brent. Okay, if I remember right, you have an associate's and a Security Plus. Okay, and he's in the field. And this is what I'm talking about. You, you want to progress and get further and further, get your bachelor's degree, and then start going to your CISP. That's the next level tier. Okay, you don't have to get a master's. You don't have to get the PhD. If you want a PhD, then you're basically going to be in academia. But that's that's essentially the uh, career progression in our field. I would also focus on internships as well. Yes, Because definitely. once you get your foot in the door, so that's how I got started with the FBI. I was fully hired before I even graduated college. They 
I signed up for their internship, which I actually believe is currently open until October for you to sign up for it. <laughs> and once you get your foot in the door, even if you have to start off as a secretary, it's a good way to move your way up, see what they can pay for, see if they'll pay off college loans. They've paid off like 20K pre-taxes for me so far. It's a great opportunity to get your foot in the door, get yourself level, be willing to move as well. So you're gonna have to take risk. Uh, for the internship, they pay you, but they don't pay for your accommodations, but they have them all over the nation. So if people are competing to go to somewhere affordable like Oklahoma City, see if you can end up in Alaska. They have internship opportunities everywhere and that flexibility makes you a better candidate. And I would just add to that as well, uh, besides internships, also going to networking events is another obviously good thing to do as well. Meeting people that are in the industry, seeing what organizations are out there, and just meeting people is another great way to help kind of get your foot in the door. There are two questions. I can speak specifically to that. Uh, at Northrop, we have interns opening, internships opening for our starting of our summer internships next year. You apply now, they go through next uh, year. For those that are collegiate juniors, so if you're finishing your associate's degree and you're gonna transfer to a four-year university, you qualify as a junior, okay? So you can do that. It is paid internships through the summer. You work all summer long, and there, there's sites all over the country. Um, it's on the Northrop Career site, and just like the FBI site, it's on there. You can go through their uh, career site as well and find these internships. I would highly suggest that. In, uh, there you have software, we have software engineering positions open for that. And then from there, once you get your foot in the door, either one of them, whether it's DOD, DOJ, <coughs> you're in. That's the big thing. Once you get in through those internships, you're set. They see that you're in there, they're gonna want you back the following year, and then they usually hire those people on permanently because they now they know your skill set, they know that you're dependable, and that's how you go from there. Once you get hired on, then they start paying for education, for that furthering of that education, to go for a master's degree. So these are the types of things that you might want to keep in focus. Going from software into security would be a perfect example. I've got a software engineer that's gonna be coming into cybersecurity. He's a level two engineer. He's making $80,000 a year. He only started two years ago. He was here in Oklahoma City. It's not a bad pay rate for Oklahoma City. No. I'm pulling him in to be a level two cyber. He's not gonna get any pay raise, but he's moving over to cyber. Why? Because he went and got his Security Plus and his CISSP. And I will also point out that, you know, from a cybersecurity, you can come at it from two different perspectives. Um, <clears throat> you have some schools that focus more on the development side, and you have more others that focus more on the systems network side. Um, so, and really both sides are needed in cybersecurity. There's not, not one's not um, better than the other necessarily. They're just two different focuses. Um, so if you're not, if you're not f comfortable with development, you may come from a systems um, networking side. Whereas if you're not really don't want to do work with systems and networks, you may come from a development side. So there's more than one way to get into cybersecurity, so. And if you're really concerned that you're not finding anything in your field that's taking you in quite yet, so I started off doing biomedical research on snakes. <laughs> My first internship was with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and it doesn't seem related. However, that ability to process data and have the stomach for something disgusting, <laughs> like cutting snake op snakes open all the time, but also, like, I had to practice statistics. I had to do data analytics. I had to start doing data parsing at an early stage in my education. And that actually transferred very well because at the core, sciences are pretty much math. Sciences are math, they're physics. It's all those core parts of nature and how the world works. So if you're staying in the science realm at least, heck, even if you end up doing policy and you're going over to cybersecurity and you're focusing on government, Different internships can definitely feed your background and make you more diverse of a candidate and more competitive in the field. Guys, I have to say our time is a big